Good evening, everyone, and welcome. In the spirit of reconciliation, the Los Angeles Public Library recognizes and acknowledges the first peoples of this land. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all indigenous people today. For more information on which territory you may reside on, please visit Native Land uh, California. I'm Jessica Strand, the Director of Public Programming at the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. I'm thrilled to welcome you to our first show of the fall season um, of Allowed. We have a great lineup this season, and I know you will enjoy all that we have. Um, please check out our fall programs at lfla.org Allowed. For those not familiar, with the Library Foundation of Los Angeles. We are a private nonprofit organization devoted to fundraising, advocacy, and innovative programming in support of the Los Angeles Public Library. I hope that you will consider joining LFLA to support critical programs like Read Baby Read, Career Online High School, Adult Literacy, and tech to go which gives everyone with a library card the ability to take out a Chromebook and a hotspot. The beauty of public libraries is that they are free and open to everyone. The Los Angeles Public Library serves millions of residents in 73 neighborhoods across the city. Each branch provides a space to work, a space to think, and a space to learn without any conditions or questions. Everyone is welcome. On this Friday and Saturday, the Central Library is having one of its annual festivals. The LA Libros Festival is a two-day event for all ages that features Spanish language and bilingual programs with performances, authors, and workshops. The first day will be streamed on YouTube, while the second day will be in person here at the Central Library, as well as virtual. For more information, go to lapl.org backslash LibrosFest. And we hope to see you back here at Aloud at our next program on Tuesday, October 11th, for Cody Keenan, Obama's speechwriter, in conversation with John Favreau from Pod Save America. Now, for tonight's show. Tonight's event has been something that I've been thinking about since I began to read articles about a year ago in various newspapers about the shift in theater in the theater world, a world that has been heavily dominated by white playwrights, directors, and producers. And now they uh, have made a, a world that, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought here, has made a conscious effort to make it more inclusive and diverse. In the fall of 2021, seven plays written by black playwrights were produced on Broadway, bringing light to the work of many interesting black playwrights whose stories are now being told and heard. This evening, Jay Holtham has curated a compelling and exciting group of emerging black playwrights to discuss the business of theater and the state of black thought in our chaotic and ever-changing world. Jay Hotham is a screenwriter, playwright, comic book writer, and blogger. His work includes Clote and Dagger, Jessica Jones, Supergirl, and The Handmaid's Tale. His plays have been produced at the Ensemble Studio Theater, Williamstown Theater Festival, Second Stage, and Bespoke Plays. His articles have appeared in American Theater, Thrillist, and Slate, and his comics include Star Trek, The Mirror War, Marvel Voices, Legacy, and Spider-Verse Unlimited. He's also on the board of the Ojai Playwrights Conference. Please welcome Jay Holtham. Following their conversation, we will also take questions from all of you. So thank you very much. Hey, y'all. How's everybody doing? Good, good. So uh, as you heard, I'm Jay Holtham, and I'll be curating, leading this conversation, but it's going to be real casual, and you're going to have a good time. So let me introduce three playwrights that I just love as humans, as artists, as writers. They're three of the most exciting playwrights who are out there uh, today, and I'm just thrilled you're going to get to meet them. So first up, there's Dave Harris. Dave is a poet and playwright from West Philly. He's the Toe Playwright-in-Residence at Roundabout Theatre Company. 
His play, Tambo and Bones, was just produced at uh, Play, Play Arts Horizons and Center Theater Group, and his play, Exception to the Rule, will be produced at Roundabout whenever theater allows. His work has been seen at the Actors Theater Louisville Humana Festival, Roundabout Underground, Manhattan Theater Company, Center Theater Group, The Goodman, Victory Gardens, the Credit Kennedy Center, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, Space on Rider Farm, The Ground Floor at Berkeley Rep, and the Playwrights, Ojai Playwrights Conference, amongst others. His honors include the 2019 Ali Award, the Lorraine Hansberry Award, and Mark Twain Award from the Kennedy Center. Uh, the International Accommodation for the Bruntwood Prize, the 2018 Venturist Fellowship from the Lark, and a Cave Canem Poetry Fellowship, also amongst others. His adapted film, Summertime, had its premiere at Sundance in 2020 and will be distributed in 2021. And his full-length collection of poetry, his first, Patricide, was published in May 2019 from Button Poetry. Dave received his BA from Yale and his MFA from UC San Diego. Come on down, Dave House. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Vivian J. O. Barnes is a writer from Virginia. She's a Playwright Center's Ventures Fellow as well, a member of the Geffen Playhouse's 21 to 22 Writers Room. Her plays have been produced at Actors Theatre of Louisville and Steppenwolf in their Digital Now series. She's developed plays with Manhattan Theatre Club, uh, Second Stage Theatre, Club Thumb, Montana Repertory, and Ojai Playwrights Conference. In the TV world, she's staffed on shows at Amazon and Peacock. She lives in Los Angeles, next to a giant bougainvillea vine, and she is learning how to keep her plants alive. <laughs> All right, and last but certainly not least, Inda Craig Galvan is a Los Angeles-based playwright and screenwriter. Plays include a Jumping Off Point, Bay Area Playwrights Festival 2022, Black Superhero Magic Mama, Kennedy Center, Rosa Parks Award, Kessel Ring Prize, Blue Ink Prize, Jane Chambers Student, Jane Chambers Student Award, and Welcome to Madison, Blue Ink Prize, Jeffrey, Mel, Jeffrey Melnick New Play Award, NNPN Showcase 2022. Her plays have been developed at the O'Neill, Ashland New Play Festival, Ojai Playwrights Com Conference, JAW, OSF, Orlando Shakes, The Geffen Writers Room, and a few others that won't fit in here. Inda is writing two plays on commission with the Old Globe and Roundhouse Theater, and her TV credits include Will Trent, Demi Bond, Happy Face, How to Get Away with Murder, and The Rookie. She holds an MFA also from USC. All right, let me get settled here, and then we'll get started. Hi. <laughs> so, we're just going to keep this chill, keep it easy, but I was thinking, okay, I have a, a confession to make. I had the name of this uh, event wrong in my brain. Uh, it's Dramatizing the Black Experience, but we're just going to act like it was called Dramatizing the Black Imagination for like an hour, all right? You all good? <laughs> cool. So, my thought here... Uh, was that we would just break that down in sort of parts and talk about each of the three parts of that. Uh, and let's start with, I feel like, the sort of centerpiece, which is black. Because that can mean a lot of things to different people. It can hit a lot of people in different ways. Like, I know for myself, you know, I grew up uh, in a small, uh, very wealthy, very white town in New Jersey and always had a very complicated relationship to being black. My dad was married to a white woman. I was the only black kid in school. Uh, and it was always a, a sort of push and pull with that. Though in more recent years, I've much more embraced that identity and what that identity means. So I wanted to throw to these very smart people, what does black, capital B, mean to y'all? <laughs> oh, where's the mic? Okay. Hey, y'all. Um, what? Um, my answer is probably not even that fun. I was just gonna say it's just a default. <laughs> like, there is, I, I don't, I don't. There's like a million infinite iterations of what it could mean, and any one of those, it still has infinite iterations in and of itself. So for me, it's just kind of uh, 
the default, you know? And it, the default for me in the sense of like, oh, I don't know if there's like a, for me, like a specific, like, oh, that's black art, that, it means this, it means that, because I think once you try to define something, then you limit it. Um, and for me, I'm, in, I'm interested in the kind of infinite possibilities within it. I think of my family. Like that to me, I don't know, I just like, that's the nucleus of my whole life and like, we're all black people and like um we moved a lot when I was young and we were a lot of times the only black family in a lot of places and so I just really to me it's like so centered there and like where I see it always and it's the thing I always go back to because it's just like my yeah my home and my people uh I love what you said about default because you know, people will say, like, what's it like being a black this or a black that? And it's like, well, that's the only way I know how to be this thing. Um, I grew up in an all-black neighborhood in, on the south side of Chicago. At the time, Chicago was incredibly segregated. So I didn't encounter anything that wasn't black until I went to high school. No, until I went to college. Um, everyone in my world was black. The first play I saw was Raisin in the Sun about black people on the south side of, Ch south side of <laughs> Chicago. So for me, that's the only frame of reference that I can, can see through, or my only, not frame of reference, but my only uh, lens, thank you, that I can see through. Um, it's the shared experience. It's the common knowledge, it's um, language, it's culture, it's dress, it's walk, it's um, love. And it's, yeah, it's, it's my lens. Cool, cool. I, just to sort of keep on this for a second and just, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're all working writers, we're all out there in the world. Um, what are the ways in which, like, I guess it's sort of two questions to, to throw out for discussion. And y'all can also throw out questions or ask questions. Like, mm -hmm. it's not an interview. <laughs> it's a conversation. <laughs> but just to throw it out there, like, okay, let's, let's start with this. Has this evolved in you in any way? Like, like, you know, you're saying, you know, you grew up in this, this very black community and, and, immersed in that community and in that world. And then when you left it, you were, what was that like? What was that experience? And like, how does that, how did that change over time? It was eye opening. <laughs> it's like, oh, y'all got secrets. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I saw the movie Almost Famous and they bust out singing the song on the bus. I was like, how do they know the words to the song I've literally never heard in my life? <laughs> And then to find out they got a lot of songs that I ain't never heard. Um, <laughs> just secrets. Um, yeah, realizing that people expect you to move a certain way or to not. Mm -hmm. Realizing that, that there are laws in place to prevent you from doing certain things and that are up upheld. Realizing that the, the world that I knew isn't the world that, that that the majority of of people know or understand or even want to know and it, feeling it at one point free and and normal and then suddenly marginalized and then it, at a later stage in life just saying well, forget these people I'm going to do what I'm going to do mm -hmm. and becoming an artist and realizing I don't have to do it the way that they're doing it I'm going to learn their tools. I'm going to learn that canon. And then I'm going to do what I want to do. And if you don't understand how I write, or that's OK. If you don't like it, that's fine. I don't care anymore <laughs> at this point. <laughs> like I just want to tell the stories the way that they exist in my head. And they exist that way because of who I am and how I was raised. I mean, for me, I feel like it evolved especially when I was like just starting to write plays, which is how I started writing. 
I think I had internalized like what a capital B black play meant and felt like not even like pressured to like, oh, then I want to do that same kind of play where like it's all about like I have this play that I like don't whatever. But like it's all about like this these young black girls in this all white, pretty white school and like basically the whole place just like and how bad everything is that happens to us here. <laughs> and like, cause I think I felt at the time both like, I, was, I cared about that so much cause like it was a lot of schools I grew up in, but also it felt like, oh, that's what like people like. And so like, I wanna like write towards that and write my version of that. And that's definitely something that I've just like been able to let go of as time has gone on. And I think once I started to realize the things I was actually really interested in were just like, the body and dance and all these other things that like there's no big capital R like racism sort of hovering above it it's just like the people are black and that's it that has been such a like freeing um evolution inside of my my writing um it's just something like I've thought about recently actually um I feel like for me it's my understanding of it all was kind of geared around Education. Um, I, I grew up in Philly. I grew up, I grew up in West Philly and grew up with the mentality of education in school was going to be what was going to save me from my neighborhood because that was the what I was taught was needed. Um, and education was always oriented towards whiteness. So my habits became how do I perform in a way such that then I can be uh, accepted in an educational space that will then save me from poverty. Um, and that happened with theater too. Like I, I was like, re I was like, oh, check off Thornton Wilder. These are my dudes because that's all I was being educated on. Um, and then I got to undergrad um, which was sort of told to me to be like, oh, this is the, the this is the goal, this is the main thing to do. And then I got to college, and I was like, oh, this place is fucked up too. So why am I working so hard to belong here? And then I kind of flipped on the spectrum, and then I was like, now I'm violently opposed to everything that has anything to do with whiteness. Fuck Chekhov, fuck Thornton Wilder. Um, I was so mad. I was like, give me Katori Hall, give me all these. And then um, I got halfway through that, and then I was like, oh, actually, wait, I, I, these oh, these plays aren't aren't me either, you know. But I feel like so much of life was like, how do I find someone to tell me who to be so that I know how to perform. Um, and after, I think, kind of going between those two s spectrums, which really aren't even a spectrum. There's no, it's just theater. I don't, it doesn't even need to be like divided amongst the canon. Um, but then within that, then I was just like, oh, actually, like I can now pull from the things that I really care about. And like now I feel like I have enough inherited language that now I can apply it to like, hey, these are things that actually ma mean something to me. And like within that, I can find this is how I write. These are the things I'm curious about. These are the things I have contentions about. And like within that, I can find a way to kind of upset the truths that I actually care about. I like what you said about like finding people who show you like you, because Dave had this, what's that thing called? The essay project? Oh, the refocus. Yeah, the refocus this like project. refocus project where you had like black playwrights write about like um, basically like a another writer who you think like is you're in the lineage of. And I had only recently, I feel like found mine, which was Kathleen Collins, who has all these like incredible plays that are, you know, like where I was finally like, oh, that's me. Like, but it took until I was, yeah, I was done with grad school. So I was like 25, 26 for that to actually happen where I finally was like, oh, okay, I see it. And everything before that had been this like reaching yeah. for like a mirror or something and being like, eh, it sort of looks like what I think, but like <laughs> not exactly, but that's okay. I'll just yeah. like, yeah. And so I really, that just really resonates with me. Yeah. Y'all should read the essay, it's fire. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so just thinking about that, and just sort of running on this uh, a little bit more, just sort of thinking about audience in that, in that way. Like, when you're writing, are you thinking about what audience are you in conversation with, what audience do you imagine to be seeing your work? And is it, is it a mixed audience? Are you thinking about white audiences? Are you thinking about black audience? Like, like what, in a perfect world, who would you expect to see at your show? I mean, me is like everybody. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I don't really have a, I think, I don't know if this is the right whatever, but I think about myself in an audience as I'm writing of like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's how I know, it's like an instinctual thing of like, what 
moment would I be really excited by or where would I all of a sudden be like, wait, what? And like, that is what feels right when I think about like, if me, Vivian was sitting there going through this play and like what it's doing to my body, like rhythmically and all these things. And then like, yeah, everybody else is just there, <laughs> which is like great. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't think really in terms of like, I only want these certain people at the play. There's certain reactions that I'm not like thrilled by when people are like at a reading or something. But even that, I'm like, okay, fine, but that's okay. But I don't, I think, I mean, I do love the idea, especially with certain plays of mine where I'm like, I'd love if there were more black women, you know, like in the audience, mm -hmm. that'd be great. But it's not like I'm like, my ideal audience is only people who look exactly like me and that's all I want. Cause that doesn't seem fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this thing of like trying to like find like surprise yourself or like what's the thing that would do something for you. I, I, I also sort of am like I think about the plays that for me like gave me permission to do something I didn't know could be done in theater. And it's like like Brandon Jacobs Jenkins, like Julia Cho and Washburn, these plays, like when I was confronted with them, I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And then I'm like, oh, if I can create that sensation for myself and my own, like writing for me feels so selfish and like that's how I want it to be because that, that's where the, the pleasure is um, for me. Um, and it's like a very awesome coincidence that audiences also like it sometimes. <laughs> um, but like it has to start selfishly for me um, and then whoever else gets to be there, I'm like, great. Because I, I don't know, I feel, like we got, I feel like I got enemies in every race. So like, <laughs> why, 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 why would I cater to like an idea of someone when it's like, let me just like write for like me and like the people who I, like I remember like when we, were, we, were, we went to grad school together and it was like, oh my God, can I make like my friends laugh? You know, like yeah. that's the, yeah. And it's like, oh, we can do that. And it's like, all right, job well done. Let the critics come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I had like 500 Indas in the audience, I'd be really Yes. Cool, because then they yep. would know when to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> They'd know when to like lean forward <laughs> and go, oh. And then the actors could hear it. <laughs> it's my dream. Um, I mean, I, I same, write for, or similar, I write for, for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, when I'm watching something, I despise exposition, mm -hmm. so I don't do it. And I've had dramaturgs be like, but you, some people in the audience aren't gonna know what that means. And I'm like, that's okay. Mm -hmm. They can look it up later. <laughs> um, yeah. But I don't wanna define something for somebody whose experience is different from the characters I'm writing about. Mm -hmm. Cause, fuck them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I know there's <laughs> young people. Um, <laughs> no, they, we, have, they, they broke the seal. We broke the seal. Yeah. That's what you yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> nobody, nobody told us. Nobody told us we had to keep it PG. So but, yeah, that's I, on them. <laughs> I yeah, I write things that I that make me happy, that make me laugh or cry or and hope that and that are usually very personal to me. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I've captured the the universality of the experience or of the emotion so that anybody watching it can feel it too. Mm -hmm. I hope. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Cool, cool, cool. I mean, do we do y'all ever get tired of talking about black shit? Like do you get tired, you know, or tired of talking about the race part of it? Mm. Like it just navigating especially the theater industry but also, you know, TV, film, and all of that. As as a black artist, it is. I find it. It's a very complicated dance between how much you embrace and how much you use, mm. and how much you try to convince everyone that you're also just, you know, a person who does things. And so, like, oh. Good evening, patrons of the Richard J. Weirden Central Library. Yes. Oh. oh. <laughs> That's scary yeah. as hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. That was a... Uh, that was a turn okay. in the drama here now. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Well, library after hours, y'all. Yeah, y'all. Yep. <laughs> I love the lights. I yeah, <laughs> the lights show down. I'm like, all right, yeah. we're we're here now. The door goes. <laughs> when you say talk about, do you mean having to have actual discussions about, or in the work? Um, let's start with actual discussions, and then we'll talk about the work. 
I, yes, I'm tired of it. Um, mm -hmm. Had a notes call yesterday with some executives <laughs> <laughs> who made a comment and I was like, uh-huh. Yeah, great. Mm. And inside, I was like, do you seriously not know the answer to that? <laughs> How can you not know? But I couldn't say that. Because, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but having to, I find, I mean, I, I think I find it more in, in television than in theater where I have to speak up or say, yeah, I'm not, that character's not white knuckling when they drive. Or, which is just like a little stupid thing. But mm. don't say you're writing writing a character who is it could be played by anyone when you had a white person in mind when you wrote it. Yeah. 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 Or like having to have little discussions like, yeah, that character would not be encouraging her younger brother to go to the cops <laughs> in that town. Mm. No. Mm -hmm. That's no. Um or just having, having to, it just surprises me the things that people don't know about what it is like to be black in this country. So I do get tired of having to have that, those conversations, but then I realize if I'm not in this room, they might not have hired another black person and mm -hmm. that would have gone to air. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it's, I guess I serve a purpose. Um, <laughs> in theater, I haven't, I don't feel like I have to have a, I've, been in those conversations as frequently. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of of two minds. Like, one of them is that I'm, like, kind of bored. Um, and, but I, the thing that, like, I have to check within myself is I, I sort of realized recently that, like, I'm harder on black art than I am non-black art. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think... Partly because it's like I, I feel so implicated in it that then I'm like, ah, you know, I like want more when I see like um, some bad black shit. <laughs> but, like, and I, I think and I know that's not fair. I know that's not fair. And like I, I'm like, I, you know, it's a conversation, you know, we work in. Um, but like it, it, but because I like I think I'm like so interested in like how we can find like newness within a kind of tired conversation, you know, and like when I don't get that, then I'm like, ah, I'm like hungry for it. Um, Cause I think like white, like white people are so predictable and like, and so I'm just like, I look to us for surprise. Um, but then like the flip side of it, I think the other mind is that like, I also in the context of like theater find like the, the, uh, everything in theater is fake. So like, I think like the performance of race and like the, the, the barriers set around it are like, have fake, not fake in the sense of like inconsequential. I just mean like we can do so many other things. So why do we choose to reiterate the same system that we know on stage? Mm. Um, and that's sort of the thing I mean about like boredom and surprise, like looking for newness in a conversation around race that's existed forever. Um, so I think I kind of flick, fluctuate between that of being like, oh, I, like, are we using the same? Are we using new words to describe the same thing over and over again? And then also I'm like, oh, but within that, can we find something, um, some like imaginative leap or some surprise within that? Mm -hmm. And like when, when that does come, I'm like, yes, oh my God, this is the greatest. I love black shit. And then when it doesn't come, I'm just like, ah, come on, we can keep, we can like, ah, we can push further, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. In theater, like outside of the work itself, just like, you know, like in mm -hmm. theater, I bored I, like there's something where i just don't like the conversation over and over again about like who is this play for like that oh kind God. of stuff <laughs> that i get very like mm -hmm. okay we talk about this every six months this comes back <laughs> like you know where i'm just like we talk about it all the time at the end of the day it's like for everybody whatever whatever we circle back um and so like that i'm always like Ugh. i will have there was something fun about like in 2020 in like june july august when all the theaters like freaked out and then all of a sudden it felt like we weirdly had a lot of power. <laughs> and I was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> because just watching everyone's brains like combust because they were so scared of doing the wrong thing mm -hmm. was actually in a way like an exciting, not what was going on in the world, but what in, in theater was like, oh, like now all the pleasantries and stuff we do are a little gone because you all can't compute. Like, okay, I can't do anything wrong. And so like that was interesting to me of like outside of the plays like themselves and like inside of the work 
Yeah, I don't know. Like, I just think about it in terms of, I don't know. I really, I can speak for myself. Like, I, I don't like like being um, like read wrong or whatever. And a lot of times, I feel like just because you have black people on stage, like the fr people are just like their lens is not black, their lens is racism. And like, I, I just don't think every play I write is about racism. <laughs> like some were, but like not all. And like, but I've like seen people talk about them where they're like, and you know, and it's about racism and, da, da, da. and I want to be like, is it like, or is it about like freaky little black girls at church <laughs> camp? And they're like, no, but actually it's about like white supremacy. And then I'm like, but they're at a black church. And, like, it's like, and so like that, I like only looking at it through that lens, I also feel like, that I do get sick of, of yeah. like, give me the the benefit of the doubt or give me the the leeway of being like, I might be up to something else other than just like the first thing you might think I'm up to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Either you want to talk about the work as well, talk about like, what are you, what are you bringing to the work? What are you, what are you trying to do? You know, do you consider yourself like in conversation with just yourself? Like, do you consider yourself in the tradition? Like, what is... You know, my, my brother is a fine artist and he always talks sort of about his project and like all of his work is part of one long project, you know. Um, oh, well, maybe I should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. <laughs> and do you all, do you all, does anyone else feel like that? Do you ever, do you ever think like that or... Or even now, are you thinking about it now? Are you looking well, back? now that you brought it up, <laughs> just erase everything I've done. Um, start over. I mean, I, all of my work does have a, a black woman at the center, do a lot of magical realism, and it's, all, it's usually someone dealing with or seeing the world through a different vantage point, whether it's mental illness or grief or something that sends their mind somewhere else and then we're seeing what's in their head playing out on the stage. So that's my jam. Um, probably because I, I, I mean, not probably, I grew up with a mother with mental illness and no one knew. Um, so those are the stories that I'm obsessed with telling mm -hmm. and I'm black. So it's, it's, it's not really my intention to be like, I want to write a black play. <laughs> it's just, I'm black. Uh, it's all right. My focus is more so on creating different women who see the world in sort of a skewed way. That's cool. That's really cool. Like, let's, let's follow that line a little bit. Uh, let's use that word that is 100% in the title of tonight's event, imagination. <laughs> that is definitely Wink. in the title. <laughs> because one of the things that I like about all three of you is that all three of you write, not, at least the work that I've seen of yours, is non-traditional, non-realistic, you know, somewhere between magical realism and presentational. And like, how, how are you approaching that? Like, where does that, where does that stem and how does that work with everything else? Any of y'all could, <laughs> could say something. I like the idea of this this thing of like your project. That like I, I really we I used to take well we used to take this class in grad school where we'd read like a beginning play, a middle play, and a later play by a playwright, and that was our like whole conversation was sort of like what's that person up to? Like what do we see? And I feel like it helped me think of like because I thought at first when I was writing, like, okay, every play has to be so different. Like, they can't be the same because then you're repetitive and da, da, da. And, like, watching people, like, actually just wrestle with obsessions, like you're saying, I was like, oh, so that's okay that there are these threads inside of everything. And I feel like, I mean, everything for me comes back to, I think the fact that I was raised by two people who were uh, preachers, other things, but also preachers in a really evangelical church that really embraced like the supernatural, like we believed in demons, we believed in all that stuff. And so I've been thinking about this recently of like, I feel like I was always raised with this idea that like there's our world and then there's a world existing around us that we're just not seeing that other stuff's going on. And I think like that's why the plays I write are the way they are because that's just the way my brain was almost like hardwired 
to see things. Like I find it really hard to do any kind of naturalism because I'm just like, yeah, but what about the spirits? <laughs> like, <laughs> and not like literal like ghosts or whatever, but just like, yeah, like this woman's body keeps leaking. Like, you know, like that's the other thing that's going on inside of this world that seems so normal. And so I think like that is part of my project, I think is like not dealing with, but like continuing to explore inside of that, like all the ways it looks for multiple worlds to be kind of on top of each other. And then also, yeah, they're always just black women because that's me. <laughs> so like, and like the thing of I'm writing to myself a little sometimes, I think that's part of that is just, I've yet to write a play where someone else is at the center and maybe one day I will, cause it'll be really interesting. But for right now, that's not interesting to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I feel like at the core of everything I write is normally some kind of fear and the craft of the piece is like, how do I find the most fun way to explore something that terrifies me? Um, and within that, I, I feel like I, I come from a really, uh, a really secretive family. Um, uh, Secretive to the extent that, like, I found out I was a middle child a year ago, because um, you know we got secret siblings out here, you know. So that's, <laughs> and I feel like um, what came with that was often uh, patterns and habits that were repeated over and over again without the ability to describe what was happening or why, which is why I think I kind of fell into the traffic of language just because it was like I, I was like I, there, I'm watching things happen over and over again but like nobody can say what's happening inside of them or where it comes from um, and that was uh, kind of like a source of fear for me it would be like oh I'm gonna grow up and do the same thing without knowing why or where it comes from um, so each play of mine I think is like how do I um, with the accountability of an audience and of myself find a way to find language for something that scares me um, and I think that's what pushed me towards theater and like what kept it fun. And, and I think also why um, I used to write a lot of poetry, but I stopped because that was like too lonely. Um, <laughs> and I was like, oh, now I feel like I need something where the, the, the end goal was other people's eyes so that then sort of the growth happens in tandem. Um, and I think that for me is like, if I can grow as an artist and as a person at the same time, then I think that's when I feel the most aligned as a writer. Um, and that's when I can be like, oh, okay, cool. This, this, no matter what happens to this play, this, this work, whatever, like it amounts to something because it amounts to something within me. That's deep, that's good. <laughs> so just thinking about sort of the black imagination, which is a word, um, <laughs> And just sort of like how how these two things work together, you know. I'm just I'm thinking about you know seeing Get Out and seeing Sorry to Bother You in the theater as as things that like captured for me what it felt like to be black, what it felt like to be me in this world. Um, and that's I know in my work something that I keep striving for. You know, is that is like what are the works that did that for you? You know, are there works that you were like, oh, that's that's what it f really feels like to be me in a way that you haven't seen before and, and did it affect your work from there? I feel like I need to dwell on that question for a minute. <laughs> no, cool. I mean, when I first was introduced to Adrian Kennedy's work, I think like that was so big for me because the it's so visual what she's doing and I always I just like see everything almost like a painting when I'm starting something and just like the colors and the like she describes these like you know like big drapes and things and people who have like a head falling off or whatever like yeah. it is so visual and feels like impossible to do and I think sometimes especially early on I was afraid to be like I was thinking like, what's so practical? And like reading that, I was like, oh, fuck like practicality. <laughs> like, you know, like what if, if she says like this psychotic thing can happen on stage, like so can I. Yeah. And like that was so huge. And I think also then just on the thematic level, the level of like darkness she's able to get into in a way made me feel permission to like get at the the darker things that I'm like always wrestling with that sometimes feel too 
and not confessionally or something like that, but just like that feel like shameful or like mm-hmm. I'm no one's supposed to be like that or whatever. And like seeing her, I mean, just spiral down inside of it, like so deeply, like Funny House of a Negro. I just was so affected by like the level of darkness inside of that and felt like, okay, it's okay. It almost felt like someone like taking a hand and being like, it's okay, you can go there and it's it'll be okay, you'll be fine. And then yeah, Kathleen Collins, who I talked about before, mm-hmm. I just love her plays. They're so regular, but weird in like these really quiet ways that I feel also really like a kinship with her work still. And I feel sad that I didn't find it till after she had like passed away. But like, it just feels, yeah, it felt like, oh, okay. I've got people who I can like look to and see and and it doesn't feel impossible now. Yeah. I think the first I mean, my first experience was was Lorraine Hansberry, first experience of theater, and I was just like, it's black people. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I, I do tend to lead, lean toward the, the magical realism and the, all of the devices on a stage. Um, Kennedy, for sure, I spent a, a month in Seattle and that was one of the plays that we worked on and I was just like, uh, what is happening? <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you can do this? Yeah. When was she doing this? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, there's other people though who aren't black who I've mm-hmm. been like, oh, you can do that? Oh, well, I'm gonna do that. Mm-hmm. If they can do that, I'm gonna do that. Um, Jennifer Haley's The Nether. Oh, The Nether. That still sticks with me. Still to this day. Oh, and when you meet Jennifer, she looks like she should be on a commercial for margarine. <laughs> she is the most adorable writing this terrifying play. I was like, well, if she can do that, <laughs> let me let some of these demons loose. Um, or like August Strindberg, his play, The Father, has these like painful moments. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to do it the way I, you know. Or like Susan Laurie Parks with the, the rev and repetition, and it's so poetic and, and also so moving. And, and yeah, so there's a bunch of folks that I've been like, Oh, I, I want to use little bits and pieces of that, mm-hmm. and and figure out what my voice is exactly. Yeah. I think I think for me, I kind of located I, like oh my god, all the people y'all just named. I think to the pe- people who uh, who I watched, like I would watch their plays, and I'd be like, I think you're kind of like trolling the audience a little bit like I think you're like I think you're toying with us and I think that's the, like the first time I saw um I, the first time I saw an octoroon in New York um mm-hmm. and I was like I, I was like I was pissed when I saw that play because I was like I can't believe you got here first right. you know <laughs> and, and I also was like you're like you're fucking with us mm-hmm. you know and like same with like like young Jean Lee and like all like all, like I was just like you're the the, the you're, you're making this fun you're making your work fun for you in a way that um like it's like pushing me, challenging me, and also um, like it's just su- su- such a pleasure to experience. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what that's it. It, just, it can't, comes back to like, oh, who were the artists who like taught me like what it can look like to find pleasure as an artist? Because I think like a lot of times like when I, like I would like re I, I I wasn't seeing that. I wasn't seeing people like have fun with that in like the in the worlds I knew. And then like even like. I did like a deep dive on like old black exploitation films like a year ago, and I was like, "These are so much fun! Why are we making Queen and Slim? This is so fun!" <laughs> like, and I was like, "This is so cool!" And like, I saw like three the hard way, where it's like, it's like um uh like a, a black karate champion, a, a, an ex football player, and a cop who are fighting white neo Nazis who are trying to poison black communities uh with it, putting it in the water, and they're like, "How can we kill all the black people?" And they're like, "We're going to do it the same way sickle cell." Does. And I was just like, "This is." It's crazy as hell. Like, and it's like so why and I was like, I can't imagine I can't believe they're pushing their imagination in that way. Um and like and that so yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel that. I feel that I feel that so hard. It's crazy. It's 
all those movies. Yeah. All of those movies are nuts. Oh, all yeah. that time was nuts. <laughs> truck, I, truck, okay, I watched Truck Turner the other night. Isaac Hayes has sex while eating fried chicken, while being watched by his black cat to his own song. <laughs> his own song is playing in the background. I was like, who? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Oh my God. Have any of y'all been to the Academy and the, seen their black cinema? Mm -mm. Oh. I haven't gone. Everyone, do yourself a favor. Go to the Academy Museum and see the regeneration exhibit while it's up. Because it covers like black cinema. Hey. There's that guy. That guy knows. That guy's got it. Uh, it covers black cinema from like the beginning of film yeah. up until the 70s. Uh, yeah. And like it's, it blows your mind. It blows your mind, like, in the 40s, there were all these black cowboy movies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, that was, a, that was an entire genre. Yeah. You know, there was, an entire, there was an entire industry making films for black people because we couldn't go to white theaters. And it's like, sometimes when I think about that, I think about being an artist, like, I'm not one of those people who's like, we had it better than segregation, like, that's <laughs> not good. <laughs> Oh, oh, y'all may be too young. That was a that was a thing. That was a thing in like the eighties. And yeah, there was a movie called When We Were Colored that was basically that, see that was basically oh it was a paradise when it was segregated. Where it was a middle class and like yeah yeah it was a whoo yeah it was a it was a time it was a time. But it's just like when I think about you know, that level of imagination, that yeah. breadth of imagination, it does feel like something has been lost. Something has been sort of condensed into very small boxes, you know? And how are you, guys, how are you all pushing against those boxes? I mean, we talked some about it, but like, do you think of it consciously as that? Or is it really just, you're just telling your own stories? I think for me, I'm just, I'm just writing stories. If somebody wants to come on board and, and play with me and, and put it up somewhere, delightful. <laughs> if not, I'll just cry at home. <laughs> but I, yeah, I try to not think about boxes and I only, like if it's, I remember when I was, would like do submissions or like try to get into this or that, mm -hmm. I learned very early on, I'm only, I'm gonna try not to curse. I'm only messing with people who's trying to mess with me. Mm -hmm. Right. And if if a if a theater is only doing, I don't know, Death of a Salesman and 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 maybe one August Wilson play, and and the white Oklahoma, um, <laughs> the white straight Oklahoma, they're not gonna want what I do. So it, yeah. I'm wasting my time trying to trying to get in there and mm -hmm. um, go where where you want it, um, yeah. I, sorry, just to sort of talk what Vivian was talking about, about that moment, that post-George Floyd moment, mm. mm -hmm. which was now two years ago, and here we are today, like, what do you feel, where do you feel like theater has shaken out of all of that? Because it still feels, you know, we just had Seaman Ketz, uh, Vivian's beautiful play, The Sensational Seaman Ketz, up at uh, Ojai, and that was an interesting experience because the cast is all very young and black, the play is very black, very female, the audience in Ojai is not those things. <laughs> and like, it feels, you know, it, it feels, and also to that, like, you know, Tambo and Bones was up there, and welcome to Matson was there. Yeah, welcome to Matt. All of you have been up there, and like, Dave, I don't know if you know, I was on the committee, and I was actually concerned that, about having Tambo and Bones in Ojai, yeah. because I was like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how they're gonna take this. So, how are you finding moving into <laughs> theater spaces that are in some ways regressing, regressing to the main, main you know, regressing to what they were before? but they've invited all of us in to hang out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's so funny. <laughs> Theater, it's, uh, in, a, in one way I understand the like immense financial, like just like being knocked completely down that theater went through that like a lot of other entertainment industries I feel like 
didn't have exactly the same thing because it's just like we can only operate with other people <laughs> and there was a time when we just can't do like and like yeah. it was slow so like to come back and like equity was behind sag like there were just all these things that made it and so in a way i understand the thing of like why there's all these like one person and two person shows right now that are happening mm -hmm. it is very disheartening <laughs> to see like because I feel like during the pandemic, everybody's like, I want theater to come back, like, big and crazy. And, uh, and then everybody, like, came back and we're like, we got to do these one-man shows. Because <laughs> it's all we can afford to do. And so that, yeah, that really, it, it didn't make me angry. Because, I, like I said, I understood it. But I did feel, like, very sad. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of, like, the being invited to the table all of a sudden in 2020. And then, yeah, I think that's... I think it's interesting. It's like all this, like, I feel like the thing of like, they'll commission you and they'll have you do readings and like come hang out with us in this way. And then, like, right when it comes time to talk about a production, <laughs> it's like, well, <laughs> like that play people talk about. And they're always like, I loved reading that mm -hmm. play. Like, we will never do it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. great. <laughs> Dope, like that's so cool of you to say that to my face. <laughs> but like, yep. I do think there's something that that feels more disheartening, that part of it, because I it, it did feel so much like maybe just through shame alone, white theaters are being like actually forced to deal mm -hmm. with it. And then it seems like maybe, maybe not so much now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So many readings. Yeah, a lot of readings. <laughs> so like, I've never had that many readings. <laughs> Mm. It was just a concentrate, and so many, it's on our short list. Mm -hmm. Or, yeah, we, we love your work, but <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of, like, welcome and come, and we want to, and then, <laughs> and that was it. Yeah. Um, lately, I feel like it's gotten better, like, yeah. for me. Um, had better conversations <laughs> recently, mm -hmm. but there was a, a the it, during the like yeah it was weird. Mm -hmm. It was like we're so excited to talk with you and be in conversation with you and do your reading and get this grant money to do your reading. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, be in conversation with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of buzzwords came yeah. out of twenty twenty. <laughs> I don't really know how I feel about theater right now. Yeah. Um, I, I I I had had. Um, and it was like very great and like great for like pre pandemic had had uh, four shows lined up and then March 2020 hit. And I was, I was like two weeks before going to rehearsal the first one, March 2020, everything got postponed. So then suddenly it was, and that's why I moved to LA instead of moving to New York is because I was like, oh, I got to come here and just do TV and film because theater's not happening. And then theater came back and like three of those shows happened in a row and it like was like, uh, I was really grateful for it. It was great, and also it was like so exhausting and thankless, <laughs> um, and like, and it's it's so fleeting too, in a way where like now, like I don't even really think about the industry as much as I think like, oh, what do I want from theater mm -hmm. now um, that I've just like experienced doing it at the scale I like wanted to do it when I was like starting to write the plays. Um, that's not even an answer. I'm now. I'm, now I'm sitting here asking myself questions. I'm like, damn. What am I? What am I doing? Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Before Dave's existential crisis settles in, <laughs> I'm getting the high sign that it's time for some questions from the audience. So we've got uh, Tiffany over here and Jorge over there with microphones. So just put up your hand if you've got a question for us. All right. We got one right here. Oh, look, the lights are up. We can. See. <laughs> As writers. How do you navigate the world of um, film and television and still retain your blackness? And when you get into the room with other writers or producers, they say, I don't understand this at all. Um, thank you for coming, and we'll keep you in mind for something in the future. How do you, how do you, like, how do you navigate TV and film as a black writer and dealing with producers who tell you, uh -huh. thank you for coming, we'll keep you in mind. Like, how do you, how do you navigate those, that difficulty? Mm -hmm. Well, I learned to stop putting focus or energy into jobs that I don't love. Mm -hmm. Cause that's the worst thing on the planet to be stuck on a show or even to not get it, but to do all the research and to put so much energy into trying to get something where 
you're not if you're not into it because that's a lot of hours of your life to be in it. Mm. Um, so trying to like if it's staffing on someone else's show, make sure it's something I really love because I'm I've made the mistake of taking a job because oopsie I made the mistake of taking a job my first job that was like oh a job they want me but they didn't want me. Mm. They definitely did not want my black boy. <laughs> <laughs> I become a showrunner, which is happening in real estate. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm. I, I'm. Yeah, because it's me. <laughs> it wouldn't be. I wouldn't hire people because they fit a a category. I would hire people because I love their voice and their writing and I believe in their talent and I would let them write as much as possible on the show and and listen and, and mm. I've had some great showrunners who've set great examples for me and I hope to to follow in their footsteps. Um, when it's in terms of like selling shows or, or developing my own work, again, you partner with people who have, you, you don't just jump in a bed with anybody, you partner with it, that's a rule for life. You <laughs> partner with people who have the same interests, who want to create the same kind of work that you want to that you want to create, and who will fight alongside you to make that happen, as opposed to you feeling like it's me and me versus them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna answer my own my the existential dilemma I had three minutes ago. I'm gonna answer <laughs> I'm gonna answer it now by saying it's still it's still fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Like I was like, oh yeah, all the. <laughs> Like with TV and film, I mean, like all all of it. I I, I had been opposed to writing in for TV and film for a long time, um, just because I was like, oh, the 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 joys that I find in doing it for theater, I'm not are not going to translate into mm -hmm. these other uh, media. And then um, I did it, and I was like, oh, I'm having a good time. And like, not to say it wasn't like its own kind of hell, because um, it is. But that's also just like <laughs> the industry and being a human. Um, so yeah, it's it's still the writing itself is still fun. So as long as I can keep that, then I'm gonna keep doing it and as long as that can that can stay true across all three and like I hope it does and if it doesn't then I don't know I'll go like beekeep or something <laughs> <laughs> I've now in both rooms I've, I'm still relatively new to like TV and film but I've been in two rooms and I was the only black writer in both and now I know that like I don't want that ever again <laughs> like I just and I had like mostly fine like you know like I've heard horror stories from people and it was definitely not like that but the idea of all of a sudden when something comes up with a black character watching like every zoom I go to your ah. box and being like, mm. all right, well, here we go. <laughs> or like the thing of like you were saying at one point, this thing of characters who could be anybody and like, you're sort of like, what does that mean? So you mean white, but like no one wants to say it yet. And you're like, mm. okay, well, but if this person isn't white, there will be more conversations we need to have. And they're like, no, 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 like it's fine. We're, it's neutral. It's neutral. And it's like, yeah, okay. No. And so like that hasn't been fun, but, um, <laughs> There is something just with the difference between theater where, yeah, at a certain point, I'm like, I'm being paid so well. And so I'm just going to like sit here and just like deal with it in a way where I do think some things I wouldn't deal with in theater because I'm just like, you're paying me $500 for like <laughs> two weeks of work. And like, I will not stand for this in, a way where like, in TV a little bit. And it's just so hierarchical that it's yeah. it's a little different that I'm like you know what, I'm going to just take this and mm -hmm. I will vent about it later. But yeah. for right now, I just got to like push through and I will let my reps know that we cannot replicate yeah. this experience yeah. ever again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like for me, I find this a lot of picking your battles. Mm -hmm. Like it's a lot of saying like, this is a hill I am willing to die for on. I'm willing to die on this character should not look this stupid. Mm. But then there's sometimes it's like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight that joke. Right. Right. I can't, I don't have that energy. Yeah. And it's like balancing those two things so that like you can't, because the one thing I don't want to do is put out into the world something I'm ashamed of or yeah. upset about. No matter how right. hard I fought to make it better, yeah. it's just, it's like that's, that's the line for me is like, mm. I, I cannot let that happen, you yeah. know? Something that's damaging. Yeah. Like, mm -mm. Yeah. Mm. Like yeah. respectfully. <laughs> would like to say <laughs> I learned that phrase from Viola Davis when I, wrote, <laughs> when I wrote on how to get away with murder if she didn't like a line she would tell the writer respectfully <laughs> and then she'd tell you why you're, how your writing sucked <laughs> but respectfully I love that right, we got any more? we got one over here 
Hi. Uh, it's nice to be with some of you up in Ohio oh, yeah. this summer. Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, hey. I did the ho Homewood Howls. Yep, yep. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> I've been asked to, uh, <laughs> when you said uh, in about uh, try not to think about boxes and Vivian, you said so many readings, so many readings. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I've been asked to help with, a, with a selecting plays for a, a reading festival. And so when I started doing that, I said, let me look at the value. So what we ask is we ask our members of our theater company to each read at least five plays and evaluate them. And uh, I was a little wondering about, you know, okay, we're all volunteering to do this, but we don't necessarily have the skills to really do the evaluations. We're not dramaturgs. We're actors, mainly. Mm -hmm. So I started looking over the evaluations. And uh, I read about 60 of the plays. But one of the plays I hadn't read, it had a, a green rating. Yes, take it. It was a play with three women of color. The other rating uh, was a red rating, which is forget this play. So I said, hmm, let me see who did those ratings. Can you guess? <laughs> uh, a woman of color gave mm -hmm. it the green rating. A 60-year-old white man said he couldn't get past page 30. <laughs> so what I'm looking at now is when we assign, because my job is going to be assigning the plays to readers, I'm at a loss to what the hell to do. Because <laughs> mm. um, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get a different evaluation depending on who you pick to read the play. Um, I just, any thoughts on all that, or is that just, <laughs> <laughs> that's your problem. <laughs> I mean, good luck. Um, <laughs> yeah, having been on the Ojai Reading Committee for some time, I, I forget how long, it, it, it is, there is an art to setting up those processes up. Mm -hmm. And having double reads, first off, is the, the best thing. Mm -hmm. um, and having... Even, yeah, and, and also being able to curate who reads what, which can sometimes be a little reductive and a little annoying uh, as the person who got handed a lot of black plays, but it is also, like, good. You know, it's also good to have someone say, like, oh, no, there's something in this play. Uh, but ultimately, it's going to come down to who's going to decide. You know, um, and, you know, thankfully with Ojai, Robert being a 70-year-old white man was very open to hearing, oh, someone really believes in this play. Maybe I, maybe I don't see myself in it, but there's something important here. And so he programmed a very diverse uh, uh, program, like program a very diverse festival year after year. And it's like that ultimately is the thing. Like ultimately at the end of the day with all this stuff, there's a person in charge. And the person in charge, unfortunately, whether they're the artistic director of a theater, whether they're a producer on a TV show, whether they're an executive, they're gonna be the person who, who says yes or no. And the, the goal is to have someone in that place that can step outside of themselves and say, I can see the importance of this work. Yeah, I mean, and frankly, I think most black people are more prepared to do that because we spend our whole lives stepping outside of ourselves to find the importance of the work, you know? Mm -hmm. What you said about like the criteria, setting up the rules of, or the, the, the I don't know what it's called, setting up like the, the criteria for, for judging the plays, yeah. setting up so that it's not just like, oh, I like this play, or ooh, I didn't like it, couldn't get past page 30. It's, does, does the playwright do this? Is the, are, are the playwright's intentions met? Uh, is, it, is it inherently theatrical? Is it, does this person have a, a unique voice? Does it feel like a play rather than, than a screenplay? Does it, like, having those so it's less about a person's likes in that first round and more about the judge's likes, so it's more about the text mm -hmm. and what what the playwright is, is doing on the page. That, that's what, what I hope we will do. Yeah. Yeah. And to also contradict myself a little bit, if you're doing this in a collective, 
a thing that I learned uh, at New Dramatist that has served me well is when you're is making decisions by consensus. And a true consensus is the decision everyone can live with. Mm -hmm. And that, that is achieved not through bargaining and not through sort of someone saying, oh, I didn't get my way or whatever. It's like, no, these, these plays are plays we all can support. And having, that, and having a frank conversation about who and why and what that is and building a place where people can talk about that, you know? Like that's, that's also part of this work and in putting together an entire like festival of things, you're gonna need to, to find that consensus so that everyone shows up for everything. We can do one more question if there is one. One more question? Hi, so I am very happy to to first be here and to hear your voices. And but I wonder because your background and your experiences are so diverse, you know, you grew up not knowing anything else but being around black neighborhood and that's all you saw until a certain age and then some of you said your experience was the other way. So is there such a thing as black experience as a monolith? Because then you have, you know, how about Afro-Latinos or other experiences? So is there such a thing as black voice being one voice? Or is, yeah, I like to, to hear a little bit about that because a lot of times people generalize, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and try to box you mm -hmm. into being just one thing. Mm -hmm. But if there isn't such a thing as a monolith of black voice and black experience, then how is it different from just a universal humanity-ness? Anybody want to jump in? Hey. I, listen, oh, I was fuck. looking. At, I was looking at everybody, and you weren't we looking. We, we were both uh, yeah. Okay, all right. I missed that way. I didn't see that. Yeah, part. I yeah. just looked up. And you was also, like, Whoa. you also looked like you were in deep thought. I mean, it's a deep question. Yeah. I mean, you. I, 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 we're not a monolith. We have a million, billion different types of stories to tell and ways to tell them. Theaters will program one black play a season. So I think you need to ask the people programming that question, why not put three faux plays by black writers, Afro-Latinas, Afro-Caribbean mm -hmm. in the same season? Um, that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, when I think about it, and like I said, this is something that I have wrestled with a lot in my life and like something that I, I do think about a lot is exactly that. One, it, there, is, there is no monolith. There is no, it's, it is the whole range of human experience, you know, like that's what being alive is. You're born into this world, you're gonna have experiences and the person who's having them, if they are black, that is a black experience now and whatever that is. But the flip side of that is that there is, I mean, there is a culture, there is a voice. And m the thing that I find most frustrating is that it is not neutral. No one is really race neutral. And like there are parts of the black experience and parts of the black voice that we don't get to hear as much. You know, and there are, there are characters that we don't get to see as black people. You know, one of the things that I liked about Nope was that it was a sci-fi horror movie that had black people in it. And they weren't race neutral, they were definitively black. And they approached the story from, with that perspective, with that history, and with that language and that voice. And so, I don't know, it's sort of, it is sort of both, but like everyone has that, like all of those experiences, all of those cultures, all those things are so wide and so full of everything, you know, and we just tend to not see that. I, I sort of, I, I, I mean, even I was thinking about like the title of this 
talk, like dramatizing the black experience slash imagination. <laughs> um, and I was like, who is the? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, but it, it, I mean, just in the sense of like, I think, I, it, I mean, we go, we go in existential way. I'm just like, who, I'm just like, it's all just like a failure of language, I think. Um, and like the set, like, I, I just think it's all, it's, I think it's impossible to communicate anything. So like the second, the second we all identify as black, we're all saying the same thing, but then we're all not saying the same thing. And like, there's no way to actually say anything with it. So why are we using words? Mm -hmm. um, and so within that, I'm just, I, I it's, it, I, I just I just find it so chaotic, and I actually find that really fun. Like I think identity is so impossible, um, and we're all just trying to find like something to hang on to to like represent something that like represents. One of my one of my poetry teachers like said that um, language is the self outside the self, mm -hmm. um, and like within that, I'm just like, oh, we're all just trying to find something to cling on to that like translates something between us, um, and that's impossible. And that's why it's so fun. I don't know. Like, um, so I, that, that's sort of my, I, I, like, I, like, the second anyone is like, the black anything, I'm like, who are you to tell me who I am? And then, but then I'm like, oh, my black ass does love a lot of stuff too. You know, so it's like, <laughs> there's no, <laughs> um, so like, I like rebel within it and also accept yeah. it. And like, I'm also full of all the contradictions of it. And I think that's just, uh, you know, the, 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 the fault of language, yeah. which is mm -hmm. fine. I thought you said your poker teacher. And I was like, <laughs> Wow, that's deep. Oh, I would have lost that. Poker teacher. <laughs> and then I realized you said poetry, and I was like, oh, it's not that deep. Like, I was bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. All right. Any any final thoughts? Right. Any final words? Y'all want to? You have a play up. I do. Uh, East West Players is. And we just opened. Produced my is producing. It's up. It's running through August 9th. It's called the Great Jerry Curl Debate. Mm. It's a real good play. You should go see it, y'all. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Vivian, you got anything? At some point, <laughs> at the Geffen, we will have these readings at the end in like <laughs> December. I yeah. have no concrete dates, but like. <laughs> If you care, you can go to the Kevin's <laughs> website, and at some point they'll say when they are. But it's a new play that I have been writing inside the like one year writers group, and it's been fun. It's the first like new play I've started in a while. Nice, Dave. Um, I don't have any plays until I have a play in DC in May and a play in London in June, but that's not useful for right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you don't. Oh, oh, oh. That's true. Um, if y'all like vampires, I wrote a TV show called Interview with the Vampires coming oh, nice. out on really? AMC. Yeah. yeah. That's. I mean, look, we the talk trailer about, looks good. That, I mean, that's a sex, sexy ass trailer. It is. That is a great trailer. <laughs> but yeah, if you like vampires, October second. Yeah. All right. You know what I discovered from watching those commercials? What? Savage Garden, the band from the '90s, named after that book. Oh. I had no idea. Whoa. Anyway. The Savage Garden. <laughs> and Rice. And Rice. <laughs> Wait. Who said yep? Someone else knew that? Somebody knew that. Nobody knew. Oh, no, no. No one wants to admit to it now. I see. I see. It's all right. There's nothing, there's nothing shameful. I was impressed. Yeah. 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 Uh, like and poker teacher. <laughs> poker teacher. <laughs> uh, and yeah, as, as they mentioned, The Handmaid's Tale is airing on the Hulu every Wednesday. What's that about? Uh, <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> Nothing good, y'all. <laughs> Nothing good happens to anybody. It's it's great. I love it. Uh, so you can watch that. My episode airs in, I don't know, a couple weeks. Yay. Something like that. So, you know. Uh, I did sneak a Prince reference into it. Yeah. Uh, and, and some Al Green, because I was like... <laughs> This guy is black, and he ain't done nothing black for four <laughs> years. God damn it. I'm going to make it happen. <laughs> so watch that. Uh, and I guess that's about it. Thank you all for coming Thank out. You. This Thank has been great. You. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to thank Tiffany uh, Moon, who is the um, producer of Public Programs and Allowed, for making this happen. It was a fantastic conversation. She knows Jay and made this all happen. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we will be following up all our programs now with um, an email that will go out to all that attended, and it will have resources 
uh, from the library, you know, uh, plays that the librarians have chosen and also resources, articles and everything about, you know, the, the subject that we covered over the evening. So uh, look forward to that. And thank you all for being here. And I hope to see you on October 11th for the Cody Keenan. I'm remembering my dates. I feel, I feel proud of my memory. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.